I'm Christian Wyman. Welcome, everybody. On behalf of the Institute of Sacred Music, I'd like to welcome you to the 2019 Schwabel Lecture. There's going to be time for a Q&A when we finish today, and I also want to invite everyone here to hang around for the reception afterwards. And while I'm thinking of it also, I should tell you that there was to have been a book signing, but because of a Federal Express snafu, the books didn't arrive. So I'm told that if the bookstore uh, manager, Andrew, has kindly offered to send free of charge, uh, you have to pay for the book, but free of, uh, he won't charge anything for the mailing, uh, he'll send the book, a signed copy of the book to anyone who, who um, wants it. If you leave your name and address on that piece of paper back there. All right, it's on that table back there. And there will be a lot of books here probably tomorrow. <laughs> the Schwebel Lecture was established in 2008 in memory of the former faculty member Lana Schwebel who died suddenly and tragically in July of 2007. The first lecturer in the series was Robert Alter. And he's been followed by Robert Pinsky and Marilyn Robinson and Carolyn Forche and many others. I myself feel a special debt of gratitude to the Schwebel family as my first contact with the ISM and the Divinity School, long before I thought of coming to work here, was as the lecturer for this series back in 2011. Tonight, while we honor once more the life of Lana, we'd also like to honor the memory of Lily Schwebel, Lana's mother. She passed away on September 5th. And we'd like to say a special hello and thank you to Liz Schwabel, Lana's sister, for whom this lecture is being recorded. In one way, it's not easy to introduce Padre Gotuma because he's done so many different things and done them all so well. He's published acclaimed books of poetry and prose. He served, as many of you know, as the leader of the Corimila community in Northern Ireland, which was founded in 1965 as a way of bringing about peace and reconciliation among the various parties harmed by the Troubles, a word that Padraig writes about with great tact and precision, and a bit of sharp, elbowed humor. His last book of poems is called, after all, Sorry for Your Troubles. He has a thriving and influential career as a public speaker, and if you haven't heard his TED talk or uh, what he's done on On Being with Krista Tippett, I would recommend those both wonderful. He is also an erudite and original theologian and is now completing his doctorate at the University of Glasgow. With all of that life and all of that work, it's hard to know where to start with Padraig. In another sense, though, it's easy to introduce this poet precisely because he is a poet, and any poet who is a real poet is in it all or nothing. God is either of supreme importance or he is of no importance, said Abraham Joshua Heschel. Poetry is not God, of course, though the lines do get very blurred for some poets. And it's worth noting that that doctorate that Padraig is finishing is in theology through creative practice. He is called to anguish thoughts. He is called to flowers to find in hell's own lonely fury that which no flame devours. I saw him on the midway path. I saw he carried two things only. On his trip to hell, this man, he is called to story. I take that poem to be about Jesus, though it's also very much about this poet's true calling. Please welcome Padre Otuma. In the name of the bee, and the butterfly, and the breeze, amen. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I want to thank Chris and Martin Jean. I want to thank Maggie Dawn, who wasn't here. Obviously, she's moved back to England. Raymond Vogel, Eben Graves, and the Lena Schwabel Memorial Lecture Fund and the family for the kind invitation to be here. I'll start off with a story. Years ago, right at the end of my time being involved with the charismatic renewal, uh, I was in a prayer meeting, and it was a prayer meeting 
where people were praying for peace and reconciliation, right on the border, this border that was introduced 100 years ago, separating what then became Northern Ireland from the Republic of Ireland. And this meeting was praying for peace. And people were concerned that the devil had a foothold in Ireland and was causing lots of the violence. And one of the people praying said to the devil, Satan, you father of lies, in the name of Jesus, I want to tell you to fuck off out of Ireland. <laughs> so a few things happened. A very devout member of the prayer group said, you're not allowed to say that. And the person who had prayed the prayer said, oh yes, I can, because it's to the devil. <laughs> so I take inappropriate amounts of pleasure in telling you that the person who was praying was English, which just made it even more ironic, because we've been telling the English to fuck off out of Ireland for 800 years. And now one of them had come over to us and was ordering the devil around. So it was, in a real sense, the beginning of the end of belief in the devil for me. <laughs> Although I didn't realize that for a long time. But it was also the beginning of something new for me, which is an attention to language that, we allow, that we're allowed to use in prayer. If poetry can be so electric, why is prayer so flaccid? So tonight's really about the kind of things we say to God when we pray. Or maybe another way of saying that is the kind of things we say about ourselves when we think we're praying. So many people, when it comes to prayer, wonder where God might be and if God would deign to come down to where they are in such lowly places. And one of the earliest Christian poems, really, is the Magnificat from Luke's Gospel. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has looked with favour on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. So poets for generations and prayers also have wondered whether there is a God and if there is a God, whether that God might come to where they are. We're not sure, but it doesn't stop us trying. Patrick Kavanagh in his great poem, The One, which we're going to look at in a small while, has finally found himself able to look at the bogland of County Monaghan with love. He was somewhat of a poetic genius. He grew up in a rural, poor village where there wasn't um, much of a tradition of poetry. I, I read once that there was one collection of poetry in the village that belonged to the priest, and the priest used to let him borrow it. And he dreamt of moving to Dublin to be part of the great literati in Dublin. It was a great literary tradition in Dublin. Um, and when he got there, they hated him because they had been writing with great fantasy about the peasant poet. And then one turned up <laughs> and was better than them all. And it turned him in a terrible way. For years, he was filled with this awful comparisons and you did not want to be written about by him. He spent much of his life writing sharp inked critiques of people whose attentions he's, he despised as much as he desired. Later in life, he became ill, and he also fell in love at the same time. And falling in love turned him towards something of the earth that he had carried with him all along. And he was able to realize that the humble bogland place that he came from, the place where apparently nothing important ever happens, might be a place where some bog-smelling god might want to look. So we'll read the poem. You'll see it there on the left-hand side of the first side of your handout. The one. Green, blue, yellow, and red. God is down in the swamps and the marshes, sensational as April, and almost incredible, the flowering of our catharsis. A humble scene in a backward place where no one important ever looked. The raving flowers looked up in the face of the one and the endless, the mind that has balked the profoundest of mortals. A primrose a violet, a violent wild iris, but mostly anonymous performers, yet an important occasion as the muse at her toilet pre prepared to inform the local farmers that beautiful, beautiful, beautiful God was breathing his love by a cutaway bog. 
the opulence in this poem is overwhelming, especially in comparison to some of his other poems. Green, blue, yellow, red. What a joyous opening. And then the exuberance of a primrose, a violet, a violent wild iris. It fills us with energy and sound and self-containment. The alliteration and assonance in the sonics of the poem alerts us to the hope that he, by finally arriving at a way that he can have pride in his so-called rural and um, backward home place, we can hear in the assonance that he might also be talking about himself. So just listen to the assonance of the sound I hear. A violent, a, a violet, a violent wild iris. I, 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 I. Hidden in the description of these poems is this possibility that he might think that he too might be a place where God breathes. I what? I am. And I have permission. Kavanagh displays extraordinary confidence in the final lines. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful God is breathing his love by a cutaway bog. Six plosive B sounds. Ba, 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 ba. Six, six little explosions of beauty. Somewhere unobserved is observed by God and sacramentalized into its own self. I'm always interested in the hunger at the heart of a poem and the under poem, really, that can prop up the other poem. And perhaps the under poem in this poem is whether Kavanagh could be considered worthy of attention by himself, by his God, and in the face of love, by love. Could he believe that he was called into love? He who had made an art out of cynicism, even though reading his poetry, it's a deep recognition that he was priestly in his understanding about what it meant to be human. It's said sometimes that there's only two stories. A person goes on a journey or a stranger comes to town. And then I heard a critique of that to say, no, 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 there's only one story. Who am I? And in the face of the great endeavor of prayer, which we so often think is about saying things to and about God, I think we're always saying things about ourselves. We expose hungers hidden in the heart of humanity that are vulnerable and raw and hold us. And we wonder sometimes whether God listens to our prayers. Sometimes I think a better question is whether we do. A few years ago, I was reading poetry at a festival, and a fella came up to me afterwards and said, have you ever heard of Jane Mead? And I hadn't, so he wrote it down on a piece of brown paper and gave it to me, and wrote down the name of the book I should peruse, The Lord and the General Din of the World, the book is called. And I just thought, well, I'd buy it for the sake of the title alone. Um, I made a friend, that guy and I, Brad, are still in touch. He's a wonderful poet. And the book is as magnificent as its title proposes. Jane Mead, who sadly died this summer, young, she was just 60 or 61. She was an extraordinary poet and farmer, an agitator for justice, a questioner of God and whether a person deserves to be alive. She's a woman who watched a judge mispronounce her own father's name at a substance abuse trial and wanted to shout out to the judge, I love him. She was extraordinary. She herself also lived through her own difficulties with substance abuse and after getting clean, the biggest question for her is, what's the purpose of living? And that seems to be more of an anguish than any question to do with substances. So the opening poem in this book, The Lord and the General Din of the World, is a prayer, or maybe it's not. It's a poem about a prayer. Even more so, it's a poem about a prayer that isn't being prayed. Let's look at it. It's on the, set, the other side from the Kavanaugh poem. Concerning that prayer I cannot make. Jesus, I am cruelly lonely, and I do not know what I have done, nor do I suspect that you will answer me. And... What is more, I have spent these bare months bargaining with my soul as if I could make her promise to love me, when now it seems that what I meant when I said so was that the river reflects the railway bridge just as the sky says it should. It speaks that language. I do not know who you are. I come here every day to be beneath this bridge, to sit beside this river, so I must have seen the way the clouds just slide under the rusty arch without snagging on the boats, how they are borne along on the dark water. I must have noticed their fluent speed and also how that tattered blue t-shirt remains snagged on the crown of the mostly sunk dead tree, despite the current's constant pulling. Yes, 
Somewhere in their mind there must be the image of a sky-blue t-shirt caught and the white islands of ice flying by and the light clouds flying slowly under the bridge. Though today the river's fully melted. I must have seen, but I did not see. I am not equal to my longing. Somewhere there should be a place the exact shape of my emptiness. There should be a place responsible for taking one back. The river, of course, has no mercy. It just lifts the dead fish toward the sea. Of course, of course, what I meant when I said so was that there should be a place. On the far bank, the warehouse lights blink red, then green, and all the yellow machines with their rusted scoops and lifts sit under a thin layer of sunny frost. And look, my own palm there slowly rocking. It is my pale palm, palm where a black pebble is turning and turning. Listen, all you bare trees, burrs, brambles, piles of twigs, red and green lights flashing, muddy bottle shards, shoe half buried. Listen, listen, I am holy. <laughs> there are so many ways that we could spend time with this extraordinary poem. Just a couple of observations as how filled this poem is with location and objects. Let's listen to the list of the objects. The river, the railway bridge, the sky, this bridge, this river, the clouds, the rusty arch, the bolts, the dark water, the tat... ...things and turns toward her own palm and the pebble in it, her pale palm. <laughs> what she does there, though, is so interesting. She's been wondering about what the soul is. She's been wondering about what God is, wondering about what Jesus is. And she finds herself back looking at her own body, her own enfleshed nature. This isn't a prayer to Jesus anymore. It's a prayer to herself. She's desperate, and it seems she's desperate to overhear herself say something. What's it for? Is it to be seen by Jesus? Is that her desire? The statements and the questions repeated are really notable. I do not know what I've done. Bargaining with my soul as if I could make her promise to love me. I do not know who you are. I must have seen the way. I must have noticed. Yes, somewhere in their mind there must be the image of. I must have seen, but I did not see. I'm not equal to my longing. Somewhere there should be. There should be a place responsible for taking one back. What I meant when I said soul was that there should be a place. And in the midst of this place, she makes an altar. And in the absence of a body, anybody else, she seems to become priest and sacrament and altar and sacrifice all at once. She blesses herself without the approval of anyone. She's imagining a place but stops imagining. She just starts to look around. In a carried in the jesting mind of a careless God. I will not bend and grovel when I die. If he says my sins are myriad, I will ask why he made me so imperfect. And he will say, my chisels were blunt. I will say, then why did you make so many of me? <laughs> so like R.S. Thomas, who speaks of the God so regularly rather than God, Spike Milligan here for the first part of the poem seems to speak of God in the third person. There is no intimacy of you happening here. He's stuck in the devastation of his experience of being his I. But in this place, in the midst of the trauma of it all, he is powerful. He can hear God speaking. And even in the experience of hearing God speak, Spike Milligan has something to say back. Saving the intimacy of thou for a final accusatory line. Then why did you make so many of me? Notably, this poem stresses the verb say rather than ask. And the final line is a line, not a question. He's not asking anything. He's saying something. To whom is he speaking? Does this prayer, if it can be called a prayer, I'm not sure what he'd have liked to, to be called. It, when he died, he requested, and this request was followed through, that on his grave would be written, I told you I was sick. 
So, <laughs> so does this prayer or poem care about what a careless God says? This is a poem of creation in a certain sense, looking around in his own observ observable world in something like detritus and noting what's there. All these poems that we've been looking at are poems of looking around. What do we do when we look around and we see devastation? What can a poet do? What can prayer do? Tracy K. Smith, in her book, in her poem Unrest in Baton Rouge, from her most recent book, um, took, a took that famous photograph of Aisha Evans and looked at it through the lens of saying something about society. In the context, um, Tracy K. Smith is not just describing, but she's describing both what she sees and both also what she wishes to see. You remember the story, I think, Aisha Evans was protesting in Baton Rouge following the police shooting deaths of Philando Castile and Alton Sterling. And there was a photograph taken that shows Aisha Evans standing in a long dress in the face, in the face of a line of state troopers who were dressed in riot gear, rushing to um, protest her. And she was reportedly one of 102 protesters arrested that day. Let's look at the poem. It's in the middle column of page one. Unrest in Baton Rouge. Our bodies run with ink dark blood. Blood pools in the pavement's seams. Is it strange to say love is a language few practice, but all or near all speak? Even the men in black armour, the ones jangling handcuffs and keys. What else are they so buffered against, if not love's blade sizing up the heart's familiar meat? We watch and grieve. We sleep, stir, eat. Love, the heart sliced open, gutted, clean. Love, naked almost, in the everlasting street. Skirt lifted by a different kind of breeze. She describes the scene so vividly, and it seems to me does the audacious thing of naming love in the middle of a poem where no love can be seen. First, though, I think it's notable to recognize that the poem is filled with images of a butcher's shop. Ink dark blood, blood pools, love's blade, the heart's familiar meat, the heart sliced open, gutted, clean. All this insistence of carne, of meat, the meaty word at the heart of incarnation. And in the middle of that, she writes a poem about love, an audacious, dangerous word to insert in a time of crisis. I heard an interview where she was speaking about this choice to insert the word love, and she said, it felt almost frightening to put love in the center of that image and to imagine that the officers, which to me seemed like the threat, were susceptible to something that's stronger than they are which is love. This is not an easy making things new. There's no middle ground fence of mediocrity that she's proposing here. She is inserting the muscular, meaty word love, which for many is a way of saying God, into the complicated heart of human brutality. This is saying that if love can't be laced in there, then what hope is there? This is a tongue setting itself on fire for the sake of warmth and making words that both describe devastation and also seek to imagine that there might be something bigger underneath it all that might save us. A different kind of breeze. Is that some little repetition of the original wind that hovered over chaos? Is she inserting something in the body and person and bravery of Aisha Evans from that photograph that she's speaking about? I think this might be one of the functions about poetry, to remake God when God is unmade, to use the imagination to say things to ourselves that undo us and make us into something bigger. Sometimes these things are filled with protest and violence and language and life and hope, and to use language for those purposes. I've got a poem in there that I wrote called Make Believe. I'll read it. And on the first day, God made something up. Then everything came along. Seconds, sex, and beasts, and breaths, and rabies, hunger, healing, lust, and lust's rejections, swarming things that swarm inside the dirt, girth, 
and grind and grit and shit and all shit's functions. Rings inside the tree trunk and branches broken by the snow. Pig's hearts and stars. Mystery, suspense and stingrays. Insects, blood and interests and death. Eventually, us, with all our viruses, laments and curiosities, all our songs and made-up stories, and our songs about the stories we've forgotten, and all that we've forgotten, we've forgotten. And to hold it all together, God made time, and those rhyming seasons that display decay. I wrote that coming to the end of a 20-year career in conflict resolution. Um, I wanted punch-like words, mostly of one syllable, to pummel myself into some kind of recognition about what's at the heart of things. It wasn't just coming to the end of conflict resolution, though. It was also coming to the end of an era of leading the Coromila community. Religious leadership um, is much harder than conflict resolution. <laughs> I would far happier deal with paramilitary organization members than I would deal with people in a congregation. At the heart of this poem is um, diabolical imaginations. I deliberately moved away from trying to say breasts and babies and tried to say breaths and rabies to trip up the tongue to realize that some things that present themselves in a way of consolation are actually much more difficult. But then I did want to find a way to speak about babies the little reference to viruses, laments, and curiosities is a small summary about the babies in my life. Because they are small virus bags filled with lament and curiosity. And there's a sense in this poem, I hope that the world is turning and that things are dying. And that things are rising all at the same time. Broken branches and lost rejections. But the things are renewing. A dear friend has a bit of a pig's heart in his heart to keep his own heart beating. And lust is part of what keeps us making more of us. And shit is what we expel, but in part two, helps things grow. An illustration of another kind of audacious poetry that I'd like to look at that seeks to make things new comes from First Isaiah, one of the books of the prophets of the Hebrew Bible. You'll find it on the top right-hand column of page two. You might know this one, chapter 11. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. At first reading, this poem seems to be a mixture between violence and the most extraordinary naivety. We hear that the meek of the earth will be decided with equity. That has just come a little bit beforehand. And then we hear this kind of tame Noah's Ark of co-creating and co-sharing together and collaborating together. It kind of feels like a poem that Helen Steiner Rice might have written. If you know who she is, she used to write, some of you do, she used to write um, Hallmark greeting cards. Um, there's a great drinking game where you read the first three lines of it. I'm writing this card to you today to come to you in a special way. I want to tell you all things true. And then you have to come up with the wickedest final line. <laughs> <coughs> and then everybody takes a drink. There's no losers. It's great. <laughs> anyway, back to the book of Isaiah. Um, this text was written during a time of desolation, a time of great, great exile, when hope was needed. Not necessarily for the future, but for the present. And one of the things that you realize in looking at this poem is that in the midst of what seems on the surface like annoying naivety, this poet is saying, I know the language of destruction and judgment and <laughs> arrogance and being struck down. I know about the ineffectivity of language. I know about being prey to a more powerful predator. I know about being displaced, about being poisoned, about being hunted. I know what it's like when our sacred places are desecrated. I know what it's like to be humiliated among my neighbors. And the poet, 
at the heart of this beautiful piece of writing is holding on to hope that even if God and politics and strategy and aim all fail, hope still might keep us going. Not because we hope in something that's going to be certainly true in the future, but because hoping in something might mean we'll get into the future and then we'll see what happens. Um, I'll read another poem that I wrote. Um, where is it? It's on the other side. It rejoices in the simple title of May Their Children's Heads Be Dashed Against the Rocks. It's in the bottom right-hand corner of page two. I swear... The story of my life has needed violence and prayer. And with this, I've needed sadness, carrying and causing it. So in strange gratitude, I turn to you, O breaker of the universe made new, O silence at the heart of the most important question, O shaper of the fundamental flaw with undeserved respect for all you saw and all you didn't do for all the things you never said and all that you did not make new. I grew up with violence, and it's not something I speak about too much, but it's true. And to tell my own story has required me to find a language that can speak to violence and to wrap my own story in that and to find a way to tell the story that the things that I looked to for help, um, how they didn't help. And if we can speak of prayer, we need to speak of prayer that remakes a story of that. For a long time, I thought I was the failure because God hadn't helped me. We need to find ways, I think, to give God new names. And in the midst of the silence of God, to speak of the silence of God. And strangely, the less that I have expected of God, the more I found it easy to turn to God. This, I think, is how strange prayer and poetry are. And naming what's not there we can be wrapped in some kind of sacramental absence that does seem to have some unexplainable presence at the heart of it, that doesn't give final answers, is not interested in certitudes, but is interested somehow in some kind of connection point that is dissatisfactory in the midst of providing some kind of satisfaction. I'd like to look at a beautiful prayer written by an 11-year-old. I'll tell you about where the prayer came from. Um, And I'll read it out. I wanted you to see his handwriting because it's so delightful. Um, The weakness of God, I think, and finding language to describe the human experience of the weakness of God or the ways within which our imagination of God and our imagination of ourselves leads a great gulf between us. And finding words to put on there is really important. I was a school chaplain. I worked for a woman called Margaret McClory in the De La Salle Pastoral Centre in West Belfast. And every day, about 30 young people would come from various schools around Belfast and the broader region. They'd come to us for a day or maybe two of religious reflection. And Margaret was an extraordinary boss, and she's a dear friend. And what she said to me is, your job is to do three things. Learn the name of every child that walks through this door. Help them have a positive experience of each other and themselves. And then whatever they say about religion, treat that as sacred. It was the best job description I've ever had in my life because you're never at the end of it. It was glorious. And you will, I was looking every day for the evidence of the job rather than just thinking, yeah, I did my bit. You know, I loved it. And every day these young people would pray. They'd take part in Ignatian imagination prayers as well as write their own prayers to read in a service. No, these were not pious angels. They were cheeky shits from West Belfast. <laughs> so I need to make that really clear. And um, I don't think, I mean, I've done a few degrees in theology, but I don't think I've ever thought about or learned more about Jesus than I have from the time of being a school chaplain. Um, Here's some of the things they said. Once I was asking them to say, where did you go for your walk with Jesus? Because the Ignatian imagination invitation was that they would take a walk with Jesus. And one of them said, we went to feed the ducks, which was delicious. I don't know that anybody has thought about feeding the ducks with Jesus, but this 11-year-old did. Um, one man said, one young person said, Padraig, I was bored during the talk, so I used my own imagination to go where I wanted. I decided to take a walk on the sea, and as I was walking, climbing over the waves, I noticed Jesus coming towards me. He was in a purple tutu and a coconut bra. <laughs> so we were all making a big picture to give to the bishop when the bishop came to give them um, their confirmation. And thank God that child was a terrible artist. And I just said to the child, just color things in. Because I was a bit worried that the child might draw Jesus in a tutu and a bra, and then I might not have a job. (laughs) Um, One 11-year-old said to Jesus, "Um, 
I asked him what I'd like to be when I grow up, and Jesus said, I don't know, whatever you want. <laughs> That's a Jesus I could get on the side of. Um, one child um, was uh, desperate to get into a particular secondary school. L lots of the time they were coming to us for the end of their primary school retreat and desperate to get into this particular secondary school and said to Jesus in his imagination, I really, really want to go to that school. And Jesus said, I know someone who went there. <laughs> <laughs> Think about the theological imagination behind that. Like, not that I know them all because, you know, I'm Jesus. No, I know someone. Yeah, <laughs> Another child um, said to, um, Jesus said to this one child um, in the imagination, what are you looking forward to about secondary school? And the child goes to Jesus, armpit hair. <laughs> that was magnificent. And then uh, one child said to Jesus um, that he wanted to be a footballer, and Jesus said to him, what if you don't get that? It's a great question. Lots of times I heard the deep wisdom of their parents being echoed through. <laughs> but, uh, they probably didn't reflect back the wisdom to their parents with them, but um, they'd often talk about death. Of course they would. I asked Jesus to say hello to everybody I know up in heaven. It was a regular kind of thing. Or um, another one said, I asked Jesus why my granddad had to die, and Jesus' answer was, there was a lot wrong with him. And I loved the simplicity of that. What I was going to take as an existential question was answered with something simple. It wasn't always straightforward. One young person said, I was walking on the surface of the sun and it was very hot. Jesus came along in a thick bubble. I was burning, but he wasn't. Fascinating. I thought that was a really interesting and unfortunately accurate way sometimes. Um, one time I'd regularly ask, what was Jesus like? And one time a girl said, look, my parents love me, but God, they're so busy with ballet and piano and everything. It was just nice to have someone to listen to me. <laughs> um, one time, one of them said, when I could ask anything of Jesus, I asked him how he was, which was very sweet. Um, one time, because in the imagination walk, I'd always name all their names to say that Jesus has come along and he's, he says hello and he says hello to your name. And um, one time, one fellow said, you know the bit at the end when I was allowed to ask Jesus any question I wanted? I went, yeah. He goes, I said to him, how do I know you are who you say you are? <laughs> which is Christologically perfect when you, when you think of the synoptic gospels. Um, so, and he said, um, I said, did Jesus say anything back? And he went, yeah, 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 yeah. He looked at me and he told me the story of my life. And I was like, huh, um, that's a lovely experience. And he went, yeah, yeah. Can I color? He wanted to color in the poster for the bishop. And I was having this moment of visitation. <laughs> I saw him a few months later and I said to him, do you remember that time when, you know, you met Jesus and you asked him that question? He went, yeah, 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 story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> he was magnificent. At the end of the day, we'd always finish with a prayer service and the kids would write prayers out. And this is what you've got in front of you. One young fellow. I, but I really did want you to see his handwriting. I'll read it out just in case he can't see it accurately. Dear God, thank you for putting me on this earth. But people can get lonely, and I don't like people being lonely because sometimes I am, and it's not a good feeling. So I'd like you to pair them up with someone who is lonely, if you can. Amen. Sad could be happy. So if I can speak of the brilliance, I will speak of gratitude in this poem, of truth, of empathy and profound compassion and confession in front of his classmates with psychological insights and beautiful request and language and that magnificent redaction. Look at that. I'd like you to pair them up with someone who is, originally it was not lonely. And look at how many times he crossed that out. And then perhaps the most beautiful usage of the word that I've ever seen in my life of those three words, if you can. How powerful is that in the place of a poem and a prayer. He's a man at 22 now. I'm sure he's forgotten this poem. He read it in front of his class, bunched it up into a ball and flung it into the bin. I fished it out and it's framed on my wall at home. <laughs> I'll finish soon, but I wanted to speak about um, how tenderness can be something really appropriate in the face of violence. There's that beautiful short poem by Rachel Mann that you see here, Ubi Caritas, on side two. 
We learn the world, the first world of love and drool and sweet milk through lips. What surprise that prayer shares a language with kisses. Rachel Mann returns us to the body, returns us to nurture and to drool and sweet milk. And she seems to imply that the very intimate feeling of touching your own lips with your own lips, of touching your own lips with your own tongue, that prayer might be as tender and as close as that. In the Irish tradition, there's a lot of hymns sung, many of the oldest of which are sung from the point of view of Mary to Jesus. And there's one, Queen and the Three Vera, um, the laments of the three Marys. And there's a few lines from it that I'll read for you. A fadir or aspel a vachatu magragyal, conic mayer baule a chesa gan ardan. An a shin an machin a hille in ock vire, agus a shin an machin a rugach insen stable. An a shin an machin a dumper may three rahe, a vichin vwernach ta de veilis da shronin gyarha. In part of this beautiful, beautiful poem, uh, Mary is being depicted as a grieving Irish woman. And she's lamenting to her son, singing to Peter the Apostle. And she's saying things like this, Peter, Apostle, do you see my fair love? Oh, sadness upon sadness. I saw him at the end crucified without dignity. Is this the little son who swole within Mary? Is this the little son I carried three trimesters? Oh, my sweet little son. Your mouth and your small nose is cut. Oh, sadness upon sadness. This is a lament of extraordinary tenderness, written, of course, by a woman that speaks about how it is that we can use language of tenderness as protest in the face of empire and as protest in the face of an empire that would annihilate people and use their bodies as a demonstration of indignity when their bodies are filled with dignity. At times when Mary sings through these old hymns, you don't know if she's singing to the child Jesus being brought into the small death that is sleep, or whether she's singing to the corpse of Jesus hanging in her arms, or perhaps both. And perhaps all of us are called to be like the mother of God, being brought into these possibilities of singing with tenderness in the places of violence. Sometimes a fire burns and sometimes it warms. We hope that language can make us and set our tongues on fire. I'll finish with a prayer. <clears throat> um, this is a prayer addressed to Jesus, with whom I've had a long and troubled relationship. And I found myself thinking, what do I want to say to him? So I wrote a sonnet. We'll take a few questions after this. This poem is called, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You weren't that perfect, weren't lamb pure or cocksure with certainty. You weren't as innocent as you're made out to be. You knew people, you knew power games, knew that the main aim of ambition is ambition. You knew the names of other people's fears because you had plenty of your own. You knew the touch of a friend was not dependent on their cleanliness and you knew this because you knew need knew the way that story bleeds through actions of a day and how shame makes us play parts that are beneath us. You are beneath us and above us in the song we sang as children. You are in the piss and blood. You are spit mixed with mud. You are the rotting hand of God hoping for a hand to hold. You're not gold, you're rock cracked open 